more people will join us. Um, so thank you all for joining. My name is Lindsay Studer. I am the program and event coordinator with the Center for Teaching, Research and Learning. I am very excited to introduce and moderate this session. We have three wonderful people here joining us. Um, Aria Crump from the National Institute of, <laughs> Institute of Health, Leslie Rissler from the National Science Foundation and Keegan Scott from the Fulbright Scholar Program who are going to answer some of our questions. Um, just a few things of note before we get started, you received a notification. We are recording this session. We also have captioning available if you would prefer to listen with captions. You can access them by clicking on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And you may need to click on more if you do not see the options for showing captions. Um, and finally, we will be doing an evaluation survey at the end of the session. We will drop a link in the chat and we also have a QR code that you can scan with your phone. We greatly appreciate your feedback. We use it to better our programming for AU faculty. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Aria Crump. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Just checking to see that my slide is visible. Looks great. Looks great, great, thank you. So I'm Aria Crump and I work with the Office of Research Training, Diversity and Disparities at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And we are part of the National Institutes of Health. And it's my pleasure, thank you for the invitation to join you today for this workshop. My goal here really is to send two messages. One you know, NIH funding can be a little bit uh, mysterious and a little bit uh, intimidating, I think, for some, but there's a ton of information available to you about it. And there are people who are live people, not bots, actually able to talk to you about uh, your interest and your fit for seeking NIH funding. And so with that, uh, let me just jump in here. I wanted to just highlight that yesterday was NIDA's 50th birthday. So, and we've been around for 50 years, all the different institutes uh, have different establishment dates. And I just wanted to give us a shout out for that. We literally just turned 50, but there are a lot of different institutes and centers. Um, there are a whole bunch of letters. I don't have time to talk about what they are, but there's a link and I did share my slides. So there's a link so that you can go to the website and learn about each of the different institutes and centers, which each of them is unique with, with its own mission and priorities and budget. And each of them has a strategic plan. So this particular slide shows a graphic uh, for NIDA's strategic plan. And what you can tell is that we have major uh, focus areas all surrounding the use of substances. So uh, understanding the brain, uh, understanding prevention and treatment, the intersection of, of substance use and HIV, implementation science, and innovative health applications, as well as a number of cross-cutting areas that you see in the middle of the graphic there. So that's a, a description of what we're interested in as an institute. But what about the larger NIH? So it, as I mentioned, each institute has its own priorities and its own areas of focus, but there are certain things that we all have in common. So first off, we all have staff who are dedicated to supporting uh, the funding process. So each, Institute is going to have program officers and scientific review officers and grants management specialists and a grants management officer. And each of these individuals have their own specific role in the process. In most cases, if you're interested in seeking grant funding, you're going to be speaking with a program officer first. Um, and we strongly recommend that you take advantage of the opportunity to talk to program officers about your particular research interests. So if you're new to the NIH process, I strongly recommend making yourself a student of the process. So as I mentioned already, there's a lot of information available. 
There's a, a website specifically on the grants process, all aspects of the grants process, and that's the NIH Office of Extramural Research website. There's also a website for the Center for Scientific Review. Most uh, peer reviews for grants take place through the Center for Scientific Review, not all, but most. And NIH has a very rigorous process uh, and very controlled process for conducting peer reviews of all of its grant applications. There's a third website that's really, really useful for someone who's new to the NIH process, and that's the NIH Reporter website. So this is an, a website where you can do a search on topics of interest to you or, or the type of research that you're doing and see what NIH has already funded in that area. It gives you a chance to determine who you might want to collaborate with, as well as you know, get a sense of where your science fits into the, the broader context of what's been done in that particular field. And then the reporter has lots of information in it, but particularly, I just want to highlight that you can use the matchmaker tool. This allows you to take your own text, maybe you have a paragraph describing your research, your proposed research project, an abstract or a concept paper or specific aims. You can drop it into our system and it will recommend for you who you can talk to. It'll give you the name of a program official. It will give you a sense of what, um, oops, I touched something. It'll give you a sense of what, uh, 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 ICs or institutes or centers are interested in that particular work. So in addition, say you're interested in NIH funding, you want to learn about funding opportunities. So there are three different sites I have here. The Guide to Grants and Contracts has all NIH um, funding uh, information. There's a site that gives you information on research training, if you're interested in those types of opportunities, as well as a parent NOFO site. Well, a parent NOFO, and NOFO stands for Notice of Funding Opportunity. A parent NOFO is an announcement that does not give you specific direction about the type of science that it expects you to be conducting. So you, it's what we call investigator initiated. You put your idea out there and request funding. And NIH funds lots and lots of different research uh, across the career spectrum. So whether you're an undergraduate or a postdoc or early career investigator or established investigator, there are various types of opportunities for you to take a look at. And you'll notice there are lots of little letters and numbers on these different, in this graphic in front of you, and those represent what we call grant mechanisms. And so K stands for career, um, and R stands for research, uh, T stands for training. So those are, there are a lot of different specific opportunities that you just have to dig down into and learn about. If you're an early stage investigator, we want you to know that you should not be intimidated by NIH because NIH is very well aware that it's a, it's a tougher climb for early career investigators. And so we have done things to make it a little easier. So what makes you early career? If you're an ESI, that means you've had, uh, you, your terminal training is within the past 10 years. And there are a number of awards that you can have received, like a fellowship award or an F award, and still be considered an ESI. So if you're an ESI, that means that NIH institutes look at your grant as an ESI grant, and there are funding targets for ESIs, and that peer reviewers weigh your academic and research background accordingly if you're an ESI, and that you are expected to have fewer preliminary, um, fewer publications and less preliminary data if you're an ESI. I wanna just switch for a moment to talk about my Office of Research Training, Diversity and Disparities. Our office uh, exists to make sure that NIDA is meeting its commitment to diversifying the research workforce. 
And there are a number of programs that we have to do this. There's a link on the slide at the bottom so that you can take a look at any of these programs that might look interesting to you. And then also NIDA participates in NIH's uh, initiatives that are also focused on uh, making sure that we are addressing health disparities and research workforce diversity. And again, on the slides, these are a number of links that will help you accomplish that or take a uh, look at what opportunities are. And then also I wanted to tell you just for a moment that NIDA has a racial equity initiative that started shortly after the murder of George Floyd. And the idea was we need to focus on racial and ethnic equity in all aspects of science. Um, and this parallels what NIH does with its UNITE initiative. There are a number of funding announcements. If you open that link on the lower right hand corner of this page, you can see, but just briefly, I'll just share that all of the funding announcements related to this initiative are expecting in, uh, investigators to focus on innovative solution-oriented research that's community engaged. And there, as you can see here, are various topics that are relevant. Finally, I wanted to talk about NIH's, uh, this is just one of many announcements for NIH. There's one focused on uh, R01s for new and at-risk investigators. A new investigator is someone who's never had a substantial grant before. An at-risk investigator is someone who is at risk of losing their lab or at, at risk of not having uh, funding support in the next year uh, if they're not able to secure uh, substantial support. And if you're an investigator who can work with your institution to provide a letter documenting your contribution to NIH's uh, workforce diversity in accordance with NIH's interest in diversity, which is a broad statement of NIH's interest, then you're able to uh, put in an application for that. And NIDA actually sets money aside for that. So that's it for me. I'm, again, I'm Aria Crump. I am happy to uh, speak with you if you're interested in learning more about NIDA or NIH. And my slides also have some additional links. So thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Aria. I dropped um, Aria's slides in the chat for everybody and they have working links, so feel free to download that. We are gonna move on to Keegan Scott from Fulbright. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Can you see my screen? Great, thank you. All right, well, hello everyone. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, welcome. I'm excited to be here. Uh, this is very, uh, you know, it's wonderful for Fulbright to, of course, be joined by our colleagues um, here in National Fellowships uh, and doing all that work when it comes to Irish and recruitment. Uh, my name is Keegan Scott. I work um, at the Institute of International Education for the Fulbright Scholar Program, which is, which is uh, funded by the U.S. Department of State and administered by the Institute of International Education. Uh, today, I want to specifically talk about the Fulbright Scholar Program, um, which is, of course, offers opportunities for uh, scholars, researchers, artists, professionals, and academics alike. Um, firstly, I do want to touch on the eligibility requirements uh, when it comes to the Fulbright Scholar Program. Firstly, applicants must be U.S. citizens by the time of the deadline uh, for this uh, for the 2025-2026 competition. That deadline is September 16th, 2024 at 5 p.m. Eastern. No worries, you don't need to write it down just yet because I will get to the timeline slide in a few, uh, in a few. Uh, so no worries there. But I do want to note that um, uh, permanent residents um, uh, are unfortunately uh, ineligible to apply, uh, but naturalized citizens, certainly as long as they have that citizenship by the deadline, they can do so. I will note that there's also a degree and experience requirements around most of the Fulbright's uh, U.S. scholar opportunities. Uh, in short, most awards are looking for those who have PhDs or terminal degrees, but we do have a handful of opportunities in which applicants that have uh, master's uh, degrees with teaching experience can't apply. 
Uh, indeed, if you are a professional or artist with ex substantial accomplishments, you can certainly apply for our opportunities as well. And fundamentally, we are looking at teaching experience. Uh, we are, most opportunities are looking for educators in the classroom. Uh, I do want to note that Fulbright U.S. Scholar alums um, are eligible to apply. If anyone is an alum uh, who is joining today, welcome. We love to see the Fulbright family uh, represented. Uh, but I do want to note that there is a two-year waiting period between the end of your previous Fulbright Scholar uh, grant and before you can then reapply. So with that, if you have uh, if your previous grant ended uh, before September 15, 2022, then you would be eligible for, again, uh, the 2025-2026 competition as the deadline is September 16th, 2024. So now that you've determined your eligibility, what's important to note is to then, uh, of course, uh, select the award that is right for you. Uh, the Fulbright Scholar Program offers more than 400 individual awards in more than 100 countries worldwide to teach, research, teach and conduct research, carry out a professional project, or even attend a two-week seminar. I will note that you can find all of our opportunities at fulbrightscholars.org slash awards slash search. Um, what's important to note, of course, that is that you can only apply to one award per application cycle. So it's very important that you are selecting the award most closely related to your project and your interest, and of course, in which benefits you and your host country and host institution. So within the Fulbright uh, US Scholar Awards, I do want to uh, make sure that you understand the different types of award uh, types. Uh, fundamentally, uh, we use the term scholar awards to describe all of our opportunities. But within Scholar Awards, we do have subsets of opportunities, the first of which are postdoctoral awards. So postdoc awards uh, are specifically for those who are um, essentially researchers who have uh, completed their PhD within the past five years. So if that describes you, I recommend looking at the postdoc opportun opportunities as they are often overlooked. Now, on the other side of the coin, if you have had more than seven to 13 years of experience uh, you know, in your field as a teacher or a scholar, you could then apply for the Distinguished Scholar Awards. Now, the Distinguished Scholar Awards are often um, for teaching or teaching and research opportunities. Um, and so these are really, again, uh, as they are very specific awards, they're often overlooked uh, as well. So certainly consider that um, if you do have that experience. Uh, something that I do want to note is that every award is different, so you do have to make sure you're reading the award parameters closely to see if you are eligible, as some Distinguished Scholar Awards actually ask specifically for more than 10 years or more than 13 and so on. So make sure that you fall firmly within those parameters. I will note that all Fulbright U.S. Scholar Awards vary in length from 2 to 12 months. So some awards may specifically be uh, five months. Other awards may allow applicants to choose a time frame that is, say, six to 10 months. It fundamentally depends. Again, as I noted, every award is different. So make sure to read that, you know, read that description very closely. Now, when discussing the award length, I do want to note the flex option. Uh, this particular option is offered in 60 countries uh, worldwide, and it allows applicants to divide their time into two to three segments over a two year period. So if your research um, uh, you know, requires this, this might be a really great opportunity uh, for you, um, as fundamentally, most Fulbright awards are continuous grants. So certainly, if you're looking for a bit of flexibility, make sure to filter for the flex option when, uh, when in our award catalog. Now, of course, as I noted, selecting the right award is very, very important in the process of applying to the Fulbright Scholar Program. On the right hand of the screen, you can see the four main activity types, teaching, research, teaching and research, and professional projects. Um, what's important to note is that some awards may offer all four activity types. Other awards may offer only one, two, or three of the activity types. Again, be sure to check which award um, you know, what is possible with which award as fundamentally, I always receive calls from applicants near the deadline saying, Keegan, I, you know, I have all this information input in the application, but where do I select research? And I, of course, have to bring the bad news and say that's simply not possible. 
In addition to the you know, parameters around activity types, there are different things to note around um, language ability. Most of our awards do require uh, do not require a language other than English, but some awards recommend or require a foreign language. If you do have those skills, certainly that might be uh, something to uh, look at and leverage when you apply and, of course, select your award. Most awards are also open to folks in all disciplines and all fields. About half of our opportunities um, are specifically, but the other half are discipline specific. So make sure to um, check to see um, if there are awards specifically in your field, as we encourage applicants to apply to those awards, as that is a smaller applicant pool. In addition, as I noted, make sure to think about the relevance of the project to your um, host uh, country and host institution, and of course, the benefits you would bring back to the US. A little bit about the application components. Uh, so on the left-hand uh, side of the screen here, we do have our main, um, uh, main components. Firstly, the application form itself. This is really you know, the information you uh, input into our application portal, the award, the discipline, and so on. Uh, in addition, we have the core of your application, which is the project statement. Now, this is a three to five page document, which outlines exactly what you intend on doing while you are on your grants. Uh, also, we have the CV or resume. This is, of course, you know, something that you would um, upload uh, into our uh, portal. And we do ask for two letters of recommendation, no more or no less. Uh, if a language is required or recommended, we do have the language proficiency report. Uh, this is both, this is two parts in the sense that you have the uh, external language evaluation as well as the self-language evaluation that you would have to complete. Now, I do wanna spend just a moment on the letter of invitation. The letter of invitation, if you get anything out of this 10 minute presentation, it is perhaps the most difficult component of the Fulbright Scholar application. The letter of invitation itself is really just a one to one and a half page document that comes from your host institution. It states exactly what activity, which activity type you intend on doing, as well as uh, what you intend on doing, uh, when, and the benefits to you know, the host institution. Now, Applicants do have to, of course, solicit this letter, but they need to make sure that it's firstly required. The awards will state whether or not a letter of invitation requires, prefers, states that it should be optional or it should not be sought within the award. So again, make sure to read the award parameters closely because sometimes you don't even need to solicit one. Um, now, for when it comes to soliciting uh, these, these letters, uh, there's several different ways you can do so. One of which, uh, firstly, is of course the contacts within the award. Some awards do list um, you know, emails or phone numbers of you know, faculty or administrators at those host institutions. Others awards may state that applicants may propose an, uh, you know, an appropriate host. So again, you know, just make sure that you, know, you check, that, uh, check um, the award. But in addition, we also recommend looking at the Scholar Directory. The Scholar Directory is a really helpful resource to connect with alums who can, of course, uh, facilitate contacts with these potential host institutions as well. In addition to supplemental materials, in addition to, I'm sorry, the required materials, we have supplemental materials, that being the course outline or syllabi for teaching and teaching and research activity uh, types, a reference list for research and research, I'm sorry, research and teaching and research projects. And if you are an artist in fine arts, music, and beyond, um, you do have space for a portfolio. I won't go into the slide too much, but I just want to note that when you do visit the award catalog, every award will have four tabs within the, uh, the red outline. Be sure to select each tab as that has more information about the overall parameters, the award benefits, whether or not a language uh, is required, the award length, possibilities, the award start date period, and so on. So make sure to click through each, uh, each tab uh, when you, of course, visit the website. Some tips for a strong application. Uh, firstly, read the award description. Um, I've said that several times here in the, in the 10 minutes, but that's, you know, really that in itself, that award is the binational agreement between the State Department and that country. So really take that seriously. Start early. Uh, the application deadline is usually um, September, in mid-September, uh, but of course I encourage applicants, especially soliciting letters of invitation, to start as soon as possible, as fundamentally different response times vary in different parts of the world. 
of course, take advantage, take advantage of resources at the Institute of International Education. We have webinars uh, that are country specific, discipline specific and beyond. We have office hours as well as of course, the guidance on our website. Uh, just an overview of the timeline. As I noted for the 2025-2026 competition, the deadline is September 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Once you submit your application, it goes through what's called the peer review process. The peer, re peer review process is where experts in your discipline look at the application and decide whether or not to recommend or not recommend them based on the review criteria. The review criteria, of course, is listed on our website. If an application is recommended, that that that, that journey then that applicant or application rather uh, goes to the in-country review, which is where public affairs sections uh, at U.S. embassies and post abroad review applications to then decide on selectees, alternates, and non-selectees. That list is then sent back to the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board here in D.C. for ultimate approval, and applicants are notified anywhere from January through June of the final decision. Lastly, I just want to note that there are, of course, there are, oh gosh, I can't speak today. There are opportunities to host Fulbright visiting scholars. So if that is something of interest to you and your department, you certainly can do so. Um, if you want to host someone for a, an academic year uh, or for even a semester, you would, do, you would do so through the Scholar in Residence program. If you want to host someone for maybe a two to six uh, day visit, uh, you can do so through the Fulbright Outreach Lecturing Fund. And if you want to host a language teaching assistant and have a native speaker in your classrooms, you can do so th through the Fulbright Language Teaching Assistant program. There's so much more to cover in the Fulbright family, <laughs> and I could literally go on. Usually our presentations are about an hour. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, I hope that was a really, you know, 30,000 uh, foot view of the Fulbright program in itself. Um, you, of course, can reach out to scholars at IE.org for more information and visit our website, FulbrightScholars.org. You can, of course, also refer your colleagues. So if you feel that someone would be a great Fulbrighter, you can simply input their name, their email, and they will receive an automatic email from us with our opportunities. You can, of course, follow us on social media for more inspiration uh, of how you, of course, can be a Fulbrighter, too. All right, with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Keegan. Really appreciate that. We appreciate you being willing to condense your hour long presentation to 10 minutes for us. Um, we will pass it to Leslie. And then after Leslie's presentation, we'll sort of move on to moderated questions and then open it up for questions um, from the larger group. So thank you, Leslie. All right, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to speak about one particular program at the National Science Foundation. Um, called the Mid-Career Advancement Program. And this program is relatively new, um, only a few years old, and it focuses on one aspect of the career stage that um, is sort of not uh, a common focus in many different agencies, and that's that's mid-career, of course. National Science Foundation funds, you know, research experience for undergraduates, REUs, the Graduate Research Fellowships, very well-known um, programs, as well as the career program um, across all fields of science and engineering. The MCA is focused on retention and advancement at, at mid-career, and the programs that are a part of that um, solicitation include biology, the education, STEM learning part of NSF, the geosciences, social behavioral and economic sciences, and the new directorate, which is technology, innovation, and partnerships. And there's a lot of emphasis on recruitment, those beginning investigators at NSF and other agencies, and there should be, but the, there are differences and challenges, unique challenges at that stage compared to other stages in an academic's career. So at the recruitment stage, you know, you're fresh out of your training, you have startup money, often quite a bit, depending on where you are employed, and there's a more equal um, gender and racial distribution. At mid-career and at the full rank, um, it's been a long time since the training has happened. You may have postdocs in your lab, but they're doing much the work. You aren't. Um, and there's a lot of service that people get involved in. Teach more, Extra teaching, extra service, extra administration, and if you're good at it, then you often get uh, more 
on top of it. And that's all fine. It just takes time away from research. And there's a very skewed gender and racial distribution at mid-career, so much so that in my field, which is pretty female heavy biology, um, at the full rank, it's around 75% um, men. And I mention that because women are the ones who say they are doing more service and teaching than men in all fields except for engineering. And we know based on National Academy's reports that if you want to change culture in academia around harassment or anything else, you need to get people promoted to the top leadership ranks. So mid-career actually is uh, the least happy part of an academic's career. It's worse than being an assistant professor. Um, it's sort of like, yeah, midlife, bad things happen. Um, and then once you make it through full, then you're happier, apparently. Nature did a big podcast, a series on this in fall of 2022, six different episodes. These are just two. I encourage you to listen to them on your, like, whatever, when you're exercising or something. It's nice to just hear other people's experiences, even if you're not yet um, at that stage or maybe you're through it. Um, it can be it can be helpful to hear other people. Um, I was interviewed on a couple of those episodes, not only from my own experience, but also because NSF has created this program to try to help. And the motivation is mainly threefold. One, as I mentioned about broadening participation, women in underrepresented groups doing a lot of service and teaching and admin at that rank and trying to get more of those people at high leadership positions, um, but also convergent research. NSF spends a lot of time um, making sure that people can do work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. And when you do that, it takes time really to learn a new language. It just doesn't happen automatically. And we don't have enough time um, as academics to really, you know, again, learn a new language. We don't force you to, you know, start a new field. Um, but sometimes people want to do something different and they want to feel engaged again um, by, learning something new. It's also uh, about fostering innovation. As an assistant professor, you may feel pretty tied to being safe and doing everything so that you get tenure. Once that happens, you also are more free to, to ask some riskier questions, and we want to foster that. So what is the MCA program? Which fields and disciplines? Right now, as I mentioned, bio, geo, some parts of social behavioral and economic sciences, some parts of the EDU STEM directorate and parts of TIP are involved. In an ideal world, we'd like to make this across NSF, just like the career board. So it doesn't matter what science or engineering discipline you're in, you should be able to apply. Um, the, this is for associate professors with at least three years at that rank. We also have a PUI track. So that's at primarily undergraduate institutions. If you're a full professor, you are eligible as well. If you are in biology or the geosciences, you don't have to be in that, you know, that um, department, but you have to be doing research in those fields right now. And it is, the MCA is an opportunity to substantively, um, you know, advance your research program and your career trajectory. You do that through working with a partner or more than one in a mutually beneficial way. Um, and we are, give you 6.5 months of salary so you can buy out your time, or you can take two months of summer salary for three years for six total months. And you also get $100,000 in direct costs. That's not including all the indirect costs that your institution puts on top of that. So you get $100,000 for research and training opportunities. It's unique because it provides this protected time, salary to learn new skills and re-energize. The MCA enables synergistic partnerships and mentorships. It expands professional networks, and it also provides research funds to conduct novel research and spark new achievement. So if you're interested in this, the first thing to figure out is, is your research area eligible? Because not all of NSF is participating yet. Um, and so search um, NSF and MCA and Google or whatever, and you'll, you'll come to this page and you can click on the solicitation over on the right of that screen. 
when you do and you scroll down a little bit, you'll find something called program contacts. And there's a list of participating programs that's updated all the time. And there's also the program specific MCA contacts. And those are the program officers in the particular directorates that include the MCA in their portfolio that you can reach out to. The easiest thing, however, is just to write mca.info at nsf.gov. And there's a select group of us that get the every single email. I'm on that email. And we can get your question to the right person. Second, read and pay very special attention to what's in the solicitation. That's good advice for everyone and, and every submission that you put together for NSF. Solicitations change, and so aspects may change from year to year. You'll apply. The solicitation number right now is 22-603. That could change if there's an update, um, but you can find that super easy by Googling. Then you have a title within the project description. You're going to talk about what you've done in the past. You're going to talk about what you plan to do within the MCA. What kind of training are you going to get? What kind of research project are you going to do with your partner or partners? And then how is that going to really advance your career? What are you going to do? What are the long-term career plans? You're going to have references. You're going to have a bio sketch for you. You're going to have a bio sketch for the partner as supplementary documentation. You're going to have an impact statement, a two-page letter about the impact of this grant. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. You'll have a letter of collaboration from your partner and a departmental letter. A little bit more information on those. So your partner is really important and um, you should choose wisely. The, those people can be at, at um, any rank, as it says here, it could be in any field, it could be at any institution type, any location, right? This can also be a foreign institution, it's just that they would not get paid. We also offer one month of summer salary for the partner. I also recommend that you get them to help you with the research design, what project you're gonna do as part of this. And this is only a 12 page project description total with an extra two page for the impact statement. But since you're a PI who's trying to learn new things by being in someone else's lab, either at your home institution or away, more typically somewhere else with someone that you haven't worked with before, because otherwise you can just write another grant, a normal collaborative grant, right? This is to stretch you um, so that you learn something different. Um, so it's good if they are helping you with a field that you don't know. The impact statement. Um, why is this award needed? Again, you want to put in that impact statement, what have been your past or current constraints uh, in terms of time and or money available for your own research. That could be your chair of your department, or you've started a new center at your institution, or you've, you've had um, health issues. Um, whatever it may be, you can, you know, it's, it's up to you if you put that information in there, but you can, you can add that information and tell us what are the constraints. And then what's the impact of the MCA going to be on your research and on your career and including other things. You know, um, it may be a really important uh, bonus for your department or for your discipline or for your institution. Um, everything that you do, the better faculty member you are, you can help more students, right? That is that is also something that we take very seriously. And we want to make sure that every scientist and engineer in the country has the tools and the ability to contribute to science in a meaningful way. The departmental letter is not a recommendation letter. It's just going to acknowledge that as part of this award, if you get it, you're going to be asking for 6.5 months off. Some of that may be just the summer, so you know, they don't. the department doesn't have to change it all. But if you're going to say you want a semester off, then the department chair needs to know that so that they can make arrangements. It also confirms that you're eligible, that you actually are at the associate rank and you've been in that rank for three years. It doesn't have to be at that home institution. Maybe you've transferred all of that time counts. It's going to describe some past successes so that NSF can say, yeah, this is a good bang for our buck, right? This is someone who has been successful and we want to ensure that they continue to be so. Um, and it's going to assess the value of the proposed work for advancement. 
Third, um, you know, you want to work with your own institution, especially your sponsored research office on the budget details. But it's pretty clear in the solicitation that there's 6.5 months of salary. You can distribute it across the three years any way that you want. It's flexible. There's $100,000 in direct cost. We give you a month of salary for the partner. And also, we want you to come back to the National Science Foundation for a two-day PI networking meeting uh, in D.C. Fourth, um, you know, I can't even, there's something on my screen to read what the fourth is, but you'll want to get people, I think it says, get people to read your proposal. And this is important for any proposal that you send into the National Science Foundation or anywhere else for that matter, right? The reviewers and the ad hocs on um, your proposal are going to be looking at the research. They're going to be addressing the solicitation specific criteria, like, is this really going to advance you? What are the constraints on your time? And making an assessment. Um, so getting other people to read it is a really good idea. Make sure that you understand that the MCA is a special solicitation. That means that it has been designed to enable advancements in scientific productivity that are going to lead to academic and leadership advancements that, that wouldn't happen without support from the MCA. And tailoring your proposal to that would be smart. Any questions, you can send them to mca.info at nsf.gov. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have some questions that were put together by Darian Spruill uh, with the Advanced AU team. So I will ask these questions and drop them in the chat so that people can read them as well. But the three of you feel free to answer whenever you're ready. We won't go in any sort of order. And then we'll leave a little space for questions from the, from the group. So the first question is, what advice would you offer to individuals thinking about applying for your program, but are feeling a sense of uncertainty or self-doubt? I can take this one. I can start off. Um, thank you, Lindsay. This is a really good question and one that I actually get often, <laughs> especially for the Fulbright program. Uh, firstly, I want to say for Fulbright, we have a saying that Fulbright is elite, but not elitist. And I think that's something that we always try to uh, emphasize in our conversations with potential applicants who come from a variety of backgrounds. Um, at its core, the Fulbright program does want to represent all facets of American society. So always think of that in that terms, right? That, you know, we want everyone, right? But obviously it's still a competition at its core. So what I recommend in this situation is to talk to alums. I think the Scholar Directory, um, you know, our alumni network is really great because fundamentally you can reach out to people who are in similar, you know, in similar fields, um, you know, at similar institutions. Um, have perhaps similar backgrounds, and you can talk to them about their experiences. Uh, and I think that is a really helpful tool for a lot of reasons. A, to, of course, you know, build that confidence to say, ah, okay, you know, I can do a Fulbright too. Uh, but also, you know, talking to alums can help strengthen your application. I um, mean, you, you can talk to them about, you know, the pitfalls of their project, and you can build that into your own, you know, uh, you know statement, your project statement. So that you can be prepared, of course, to um, you know address those issues um, if they come up. I have a lot to say on that, but I'll pass it over to my colleagues. Go ahead, Leslie. Um, I'll I'll just say that for the MCA or any program at the National Science Foundation, um, send in a one pager is the easiest thing. Like if you have some bullet points on kind of what you wanted, what you're thinking of, what solicitation, um, the web pages do have people associated with them or an alias and you should just, you know, send it. Like everybody's really friendly here, right? We, we have stopped our own academic um, positions. I was a full professor before I came to NSF, but I got actually at that stage, I was like, Ugh, am I going to do this forever? And I love doing it. But at NSF, you know, you get to make a difference at a completely different level, you know, across the country. And um, so the, the people here are a portion of the curve of faculty that actually <laughs> really want to help. So don't be afraid is what I'm saying. Um, just just write to us and we can help figure out where you should ask the right questions and to whom and all of that, so. 
And I'll echo what Leslie said. I think I like to tell folks that we're public servants. Um, this is honestly, it's your tax money <laughs> that that pays for these programs. And so, you know, absolutely, I do know that a number of folks are nervous about contacting NIH, but uh, I think what I tell folks is be persistent because ultimately that's what is going to uh, get results. Everybody's not gonna necessarily answer an email the first time, but don't take don't take it personally. You know, send a second one. Everybody isn't going to. Uh, if one door is not open for you, then don't decide it, that it's you. It's not. Um, the other thing that I, I like to say is that uh, success begets success. And so find examples of, of successful applications. There are people who are willing to share their, you know, what they've done, you know, that have, have been successful. Uh, partner, honestly, if you're totally brand new to NIH, I really believe what makes a ton of sense is to partner with somebody who has experience and who has been successful and benefit from that mentorship. And um, I think that sometimes you would be really, really surprised at how many people are willing to help you if you just ask. And I'll just kind of pause there. Great, thank you. Great answers. Um, the next question I have is, how do you tailor your support services to meet the diverse needs of faculty in your programs? So I'll, I'll jump in there. So my off, this is kind of sort of what my office does. So the Office of Research Training, Diversity and Disparities for NIDA, let me just say, every institute is a little different. And so this is uh, how we operate. We have programs that specifically support early career investigators. So we have someone who is central to all of our training activities and we have a training mailbox. You can contact that person and get assistance. We have programs for, for example, our not, not a diversity scholars uh, network program where if folks are ready to submit an application and they want to uh, just need a leg up, quite honestly, they can apply to this program. And we're happy to, you know, it's a competitive program, but if you get into the program, we'll give you feedback on, uh, you can participate in training sessions and uh, you get to go to a mock review and learn about the review process. So, so there are different things for different folks. And honestly, I think there's no substitute for a mentor who uh, is committed to your success. And yeah, but that's, that, that's what I'll, I'll say about that. I, I think that that's really, really critical for folks interested in NIH. Yeah, similar to NSF. I mean, our program officers are involved with all different kinds of solicitations, right? So they are um, experts in in particular disciplines and were arranged by discipline at NSF. Like each floor is a different discipline, right? I'm on the 12th floor, that's bio. And then we're separated by the, in the divisions. I'm in environmental biology, which is ecology and evolution. Um, so once you find your kind of research area, then it's it then you then you, you you find the people in there. We have virtual office hours right all the time. There are blogs, dear colleague letters. Um, every proposal that comes in, if you would just write a proposal to our core program, right? Any research you want and within you know um, an area, we know right. We we are aware of. When you graduated, what your status is at your institution, your gender, everything about you, because once all that information is put up on the board in fun categories, the program officer's responsibility is to balance the portfolio, which means we take all of that into account because the ultimate goal 
for us is to ensure the health of science and engineering across the United States. And that doesn't mean funding everyone in California, right, at the R1 institutions. Um, it means spreading that out so that it's a healthy ecosystem. Um, and we, you know, we do have t solicitations that are tailored to different career stages, but the people that you're going to be talking to are aware of all, all lots of different things and they will, they will speak to you as an individual. Great. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you, Aria. Those are really great, <laughs> great uh, tips uh, and resources. I think for Fulbright's, um, you know, we we try to create that space uh, through a lot of different venues for folks to share their concerns and to, you know, get support, get resources. Um, you know, we have our, you know, firstly, our emails, our contact information and all of our opportunities. We have, you know, more and more uh, more contact information in the awards as people try to make contacts, you know, potential contacts with uh, host. We have certainly so many resources, whether it be office hours, you know, literally an applicant can just show up to a Zoom room and, you know, my, myself or my colleagues will be there to help answer questions. Um, we have our webinars that are, you know, discipline specific, um, that are, you know, often catered to country. Uh, and we're trying to do more and more, you know, around folks with specific identities. This is something that, you know, we're being more mindful of that, of course, you know, folks from different institutions, um, you know, require different, you know, different resources. We now have a community college filter, for example, that we, you know, had on our uh, on our awards. So, you know, to highlight opportunities specifically for faculty, um, you know, from those uh from those places. So, you know, we have the information. I think we try our best to help, you know, get that to the right people. Um, of course, it can be difficult because again, there's a lot of, <laughs> we, we throw a lot at you. We threw the entire kitchen sink uh, so that you're prepared. Uh, of course, you know, my colleagues and I are also happy to, you know, meet with folks one-on-one. -on -one. We have a scholar liaison network as well that I forgot to mention. These are literally just point of contacts at, you know, institutions across the United States, but that liaise between Fulbright um, and applicants. And so, you know, you can even get more one-on-one -on -one attention by talking to your liaison and saying, you know, hi, I am interested in Fulbrights. I have maybe a sabbatical or leave. Um, what would this look like? You know, what are the institutional resources for me? So we have, again, we have a whole support staff and network around you that you can utilize. Um, so again, you know, I we'll, we'll try our best, you know, happy to, again, scholars at ie.org, you're happy to email us and we'll get back to you. Great, thank you. Um, trying to decide if I want to ask the third question. Yeah, let's do it. Um, how can academic units and or university administration support their faculty while they are in your program? There's a lot to be said on this one. <laughs> There are, you know, I will, I will, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Leslie and Arya, I do want to take this one first because fundamentally a lot of the Fulbright projects are two to 12 months abroad, obviously. So that means you have to leave your duties, of course, and, you know, you might be leaving a lab or you might be leaving classrooms and so on. And we understand that it takes away a resource um, from your institution. So there's different, you know, we've, we, we ourselves in Fulbright don't necessarily, you know, um, I guess, uh, lobby institutions and administrations to, you know, make more Fulbright friendly policies. But oftentimes we have seen, you know, uh, a lot of institutions look at our top producing institutions and say, how can we become a top producing institution? And so there's a lot of tips and tricks that we've learned from, you know, these particular places uh, that have helped facilitate more Fulbrights. Because fundamentally, you know, this Fulbright is a great way to internationalize your campus, your community. Uh, of course, and create these exchanges, you know, share this knowledge. Um, I have a whole set of slides that I, I didn't share, but again, you know, all of those things are really important to the core of the program. So a lot of institutions and administrations note that, and so they might provide more flexible leave policies. Um, I know that, you know, some universities will perhaps give, um, you know, a sabbatical specifically if you receive a Fulbright. So maybe an applicant will, you know, or rather an awardee will say, oh, look, you know, I received this Fulbright, um, I would like my sabbatical now. And so they'll allow it. Other times um, they might, I remember there's an institution that allows you to apply for a sabbatical and a Fulbright. If you don't receive a Fulbright, you don't get your sabbatical, but you can then for the next year reapply and uh, for both, you know, for both, you know, leave and for um, Fulbright. And if, of course, if you get it, you would get your leave then. So 
there's a lot that can be done. I know, you know, my colleagues and I are constantly trying to speak, you know, with different different folks to to share the benefits of, of that institution. Um, but by all means, I mean we're trying to train, you know, um, you know, folks within the administration about Fulbright so they can spread that knowledge. Very lengthy. I apologize. There's so much to say about that, but I want to make sure that Leslie and Aria have time. I, I don't I don't have that much, except with the mid-career advancement solicitation, we have seen some chairs say, OK, if you get this grant right, we'll give you another semester off. So you basically have a sabbatical as well, which is great, but not it doesn't make you a better candidate. But we'd like to see that happen. I would say my advice with working with your university is to make friends with the sponsored research office. Um, those people change some institutions. They're really good. Some like barely exist. And NSF is creating opportunities to help that, that, you know, those emerging institutions, what we call them. But um, those SROs can be really helpful in helping with the budget. And NSF gives most of our grants to institutions, not people. Um, so they want, <laughs> the institution want, they want to get grants from NSF and other places, right? Because they also get indirects on those grants. Um, so they get money. So it, they, they want you to be successful, you know, and we want you to be successful. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just piggyback on that too. The, to me, the sponsor programs office are critical and institutions that really pay attention to making sure that the, the faculty know how to use the sponsor programs office and are connected with them and that the sponsored programs office knows how to do their piece, right? That that is huge. But the other thing I will put out is institutions that provide pilot funding opportunities for um, faculty. I think are I think it's extremely helpful because one of the things about the NIH process is it's very, very competitive and it's incredibly helpful to have preliminary data. Um, or to have pilot studies uh, already in your pocket when you apply. So I'll, I'll put that out there. The other thing is I know that some institutions are better than others at providing workshops for faculty and providing uh, uh, resources in terms of, say, editing or, or something like that to help them with the process because there's so many different steps and it's it's very complex. And so whatever supports in uh, that faculty can get to help them take care of the minutia, um, I think are incredibly helpful. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, how do you foster a sense of community and collaboration among faculty in your programs? Is there any collaboration across disciplines? So I'll speak first here and say that a lot of NIH science is team science. And, and so we don't, uh, so one of the things about our funding is we have some projects that automatically have team science built in, for example, center grants. Um, but we also have cooperative agreements, which are basically a, a hybrid between a grant and a contract. So there's substantial government involvement. Um, and, and in those cases, uh, it, it makes a ton of sense for uh, everyone to work very closely together. And I think we do that very successfully. Um, but in terms of individual grant mechanisms, which are the majority of what NIH is funding, honestly, I think that uh, the investigators who do really well develop teams. And so that, that team and that collaboration takes place within the context of that award. But another thing that NIH has done has made multi-PI applications possible which means that uh, you can have a colleague at Boston University and you can both be a PI working together. So perhaps you met at a scientific meeting and you have common interest and you have a way to work together on a project. That's actually possible now at NIH when it, it certainly wasn't 20 years ago. 
Yeah, same. There's a, you know, you can work with anybody on the proposals at NSF. For many of the special programs, we have PI meetings, right? So we're bringing in those people who are awardees to NSF. Sometimes they're virtual meetings, sometimes they're in person to, to have some networking um, and, you know, team building in that sense. And it's also a good way to showcase to, you know, NSF uh, program officers in different directorates that a program is really successful and they should devote a little bit of their portfolio Portfolio to fund some of them, um, like in on the MCA. But other there are other special programs, right, that are by design linking different disciplines. And since NSF has every science and engineering discipline here, there are many um, programs that aim to do that. And how do you find that out? Um, you sign up to get information from NSF or and their dear colleague letters that go out. Um, announcing those sorts of things. Many of those have a time, time, you know, they don't last forever. They're like five years, 10 years max. Um, so when things go away that are successful, people get upset, but um, things change. <laughs> so, you know, just keep your eye out for different opportunities. Yeah, I think it's quite unique uh, with Fulbright because, you know, essentially that's already baked in, right? I mean, you are doing a collaboration with someone abroad, um, you know, in your field. So that's the joy of Fulbright is that it's firstly, it's already there, right? You have to collaborate with someone. Um, you have to have that host institution. But what's really great is, you know, of course, when it comes to expanding your network, there's so many, so many ways you can do so. Uh, through through Fulbright, you know, during the application stage, you know, on your actual grant, and of course after, um, you know, we do host a lot of conferences, uh, Fulbright conferences, you know, regionally. So you certainly can reach across, you know, disciplines. Oftentimes in country, there are more than you know, there usually is more than one um, Fulbrighter. So you can you know talk to them about their shared experience. We and you know when you are an alum, we have a Fulbright. You know, the Fulbright Association is our alumni association. And they have many chapters that are, you know, region-based, discipline-based, and so on. So there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, still still connect and collaborate uh, with folks um, and be not only, you know, a cultural ambassador, um, you know, during your grant, but after. Great, thank you. And then my final question for the group before we open it up is, is there anything else you would like potential applicants to know about your program? I'm sure there's a lot, <laughs> but I guess maybe just the highlights. I think the one thing I would just say is to talk to as many people as possible. Um, I think a lot of applicants um, you know, to the Fulbright Scholar Program are, are hesitant to make contacts. Um, uh, actually, I'll say two things, but firstly, yes, talk to as many people as possible. Um, you know, talk to as many host institutions as possible, talk to as many alums as possible, because they have wisdom in, you know, their, you know having done their own Fulbright. Uh, we don't just say contact the alums for fun, you know, uh, there, there's reasons behind that. Uh, but secondly, um, actually, I forgot that second point, but I'll move on to, to my colleagues, and if I think about it, I'll share later. Uh, let's see. So I would say be persistent. Um, apply. You're not going to get a grant if you don't apply, so you have to apply. Um, success rates vary, you know, across uh, different programs, and, I'm, you know, 20% is actually really good. Um, not all of ours are at that level some are much lower some may be a little bit higher but it's it's competitive um but it could be we you know sometimes we have to decline outstanding ranked proposals because maybe that pi has two million dollars from nih at the time and we're like you know um you're you're okay we can we'll try to find you know we'll find fund someone else um so there's lots of reasons why you may not be funded in a particular round um and it's always a good idea in my opinion to contact a program officer for advice after you, you get that feedback um call them up and say i just wanted to know if there was anything else i should know about the panel you know itself the panel discussion uh this is what i'm seeing from the panel summary um do you have any other advice 
uh, for me. And of course, that's after you've applied, assuming you apply. But again, do do apply and reach out to program officers. That's our job. Yeah, I would say everything that Leslie just said for us. And I would also say to uh, make sure that you make use of all the resources available to you. Um, it makes so much sense to network and find out what has worked for other folks. You know, what what programs have they been a part of? What podcasts have they listened to? Um, that That's one thing that I think is really, really important. And I, I threw up podcast because there's actually an all about grants podcast for NIH. I mean, just knowing what the different resources are and then uh, really taking advantage of them is, is critical in my mind. Uh, the other thing is really, really critical uh, to me, really develop the confidence this isn't quite answering the question, but really develop confidence in yourself and what your uh, goals are. Really think about your program of research, not just about one study, but really have a, a thought about uh, or have a, a, a plan for uh, how being a funded researcher by NIH fits into your grand scheme, right? Is this you're trying to contribute to the scientific literature, but to a, toward a goal. And I think that's the point uh, that I, I really like to leave with you is that you know, it's not really just about one grant, it's about you know uh, realizing your potential and also making the contribution that you feel uh, uh, that you're capable of making to the science. Lindsay, if you don't mind me jumping in here, I remember Absolutely. my second point, Please do. Please which do. is actually quite relevant specifically for this panel. So the second thing I wanted to note is what's unique about Fulbright and which differentiates Fulbright from NIH and NSF is this aspect of being a cultural ambassador. I've alluded to this throughout you know, the entire uh, panel today, but we are asking, of course, not only about you know, your work and your project, but we are asking about you. So this is something that you really have to reflect on. And this can be very difficult for folks who are used to applying to other national you know, funding um, you know, awards because, of course, that's a different structure, right? So Fulbright is different and unique in that, right, where you have to think, OK, what do I bring to the table you know, as not only a scholar, a researcher, academic teacher, and so on, but truly as a, you know, an American, as someone who has my identities? So always think about that when you craft your application. Great. Thank you so much for your presentations and answering these questions. We now have the rest of the time to just answer specific questions from attendees. So if you have any questions for Aria, Leslie, or Keegan, please feel free. You can also put it in the chat if that's your preference, and I'm happy to ask your question aloud. But we'll just give it a few minutes while people think about it. I have a quick question. Um, this is for Keegan. Um, I so I've I've applied for other big grants. I'm a scientist, and so I'm I'm used to doing that. And the Fulbright process is so different. Um, and so I'm I'm just trying trying to wrap my mind around like what makes a, a really successful application. Um, I loved what you just said about being a, a cultural ambassador um, and and addressing that. But I guess you know I saw you were mentioning like this three to five page project statement. If I'm looking to apply for something that's a research-based project at a specific university, and I have a colleague there, um, how is it? How much is it about this project that I'm having only three to five pages? You know, we're used to much longer proposals for a science project that we're going to work on. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Certainly, <clears throat> certainly, Katie, and that is by far the most common question I get, especially from folks in science and STEM. Um, yes, so indeed, you know, three to five pages is not a lot of information, but we intentionally have the review criteria, you know, 
there and highlighted because the two things that you should really note when crafting your application is feasibility and impact. Those are the two things that you really need to, to take with you um, from this panel and when applying, because fundamentally, you know, you want to make sure that you lay out exactly what you intend on doing, but note that you, your audience is both the peer reviewers, so folks in your discipline, as well as the public affairs sections at the U.S. embassies and posts. So you have, you know, a specialist and a generalist audience. So again, I mean, this is something where you have to really balance that and you have to balance impact and feasibility, not only within the, you know, in terms of your discipline, but also in terms of, you know, how can you foster these cross-cultural connections, right? Um, I mean, it is, there's certainly a lot of that social sciences, humanities, um, you know, in, in that bleeds into that regardless of your discipline. So it's it's difficult. I mean, you know, Katie, like I said, I think the alums are, you know, in your fields who have been to those places are the great resources to say, oh, this is what I did. You know, this is how, you know, what I can share with you about what that looked for me. Because of course it, it just, you know, it's different, but always make sure that you are thinking, you know, big picture of, you know, not only this forwards my research, it also does X, Y, Z, you know, I create this, you know, project or this, you know, moves my discipline or this moves my students or so on. So obviously, you know, be, I wouldn't say be ambitious because you have to be feasible, right? You know, I've certainly heard of applications that where it's like, whoa, how can you do all of this? You know, you're doing all of your research and now you're doing all your teaching. And when, when do you get to, you know, experience and be that cultural master? So it's a hard question because we don't have the answer for you, right? We just have that framework, which you, you know, we want you to fill in those blanks. But again, talking to the alums can really help address that. And does it need to be equally impactful to the host institution and country and what we're bringing back? I mean, where does the impact need to be? Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, fundamentally, again, every 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 project is different. So we understand, you know, we don't have uh, percentages where we say, oh, okay, you know, 50% of your impact is, you know, in Germany, the other 50% is the U.S. No, it's it's not like that. But we do ask, you know, about sustainability. So there is something to that, you know, because fundamentally, when you're a Fulbrighter, you're a Fulbrighter for life. So that's, you know, internalize that to say, okay, you know, I can keep these contacts in the future and so on. I will note, of course, Katie, that, you know, you are being judged on what you present. And we understand that in a year that may look very different, especially around the world when you are executing a project and so on. So always try to put, uh, you know, we always say a well thought out project uh, because we understand that that might look different just in case that it's a parameter, you know, if that's something that you're worried about. But again, there's no quote unquote ratio of impacts, right? The impact is, you know, what you make of it. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope that helped. I know that wasn't <laughs> solid, but I, I hope that was something. No, it did. Thank you. I have another question I received via chat um, for Keegan as well. The question is, um, is it possible to earn a Fulbright if we have already done so in the past? In addition, if we are employed by a third party for American, would I be eligible for a grant through American University? Uh -huh. Or maybe that's for everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll start off here. Um, so in short, yes. So as I noted before in the eligibility, you do have to wait two years. And we have certainly have had to reapply um, after your previous grant has ended. And we have had plenty of folks, you know, be reapplicants. But of course, we do know that there is a preference, all things equal, for folks who have not had a Fulbright. So that's something that, you know, I do want to keep in mind. Now, that shouldn't dissuade you from applying, right? So again, I've noted we have certainly alums who have had received, you know, one or two um, Fulbrights. And I will say, again, Fulbright's a big family. There's not only just the Fulbright Scholar Program, we have the Visiting Scholar, U.S. Student, Specialist, and so on. We do have an eligibility requirement that states that applicants can apply to both the Fulbright U.S. Scholar Program and the Fulbright Specialist Program. Just briefly, the Specialist Program is a two to six week experience that's host institution driven. So you apply to be put on a roster and then you are matched with projects abroad. So, and, you, and again, you can apply to both. You just obviously can't do both because you cannot be in two places at once. But nevertheless, that's a great opportunity to, to do that. Um, again, we have, you know, maybe if specialist isn't right for you, you can host, um, you know, again, visiting, uh, host visiting Fulbrighters. So the, the 
Eligibility requirements is a little fuzzy if you are to, you, if you work with USAID or the State Department. Um, that I would have to address through an email just to verify your eligibility requirements. So I'm going to leave it at that. You know, reach out to scholars at IE.org if you are, um, you know, concerned about that aspect. other questions just give it a moment in case someone's typing something in the chat okay you we, oh yeah, Keegan, Keegan mentioned in the chat for additional questions related to the Fulbright Scholar Program, I recommend reaching out to scholars at IIE.org. So if you don't have questions now, but you have questions later, um, please feel free to use our wonderful panelists and, and get your questions answered. Any questions, final going once, going twice? All right. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to Leslie, Aria, and Keegan for joining and giving us the snapshot of your um, presentations. We appreciate it. If anyone has any lingering questions, you are welcome to email CTRL at American and I can point you in the right direction. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Oh, and I'm having an evaluation link. If you, I'm so sorry. I got wrapped up in what I was talking about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all and best of luck on your full by journey.